not milk. This is boxed water. Did you guys know it exists? People were freaking out because of the first service. This is what my wife buys me. And it says boxed water is better. I don't know if it is, but it definitely tastes good. Amen? And it's, did they cancel the game today or what? I mean, why are people still in church? This is crazy. God is at work in Huntington Beach. Amen? God first. That's right. Well, let's pray. God, we just thank you today. The Lord, in the midst of us, in the midst of life, in the midst of all that is going on, you are present. God, you are on the throne. You are good. You are faithful. And Lord, your people would hear from you today. God, that those who don't know you would come to life. They'd be born again. Those that do would be encouraged, God. And particularly, I ask that we would see that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. God, lead us, direct us. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Thank you, God, for sending your Son. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for walking these aisles, even now. And in Jesus' name we pray and say, amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go over to Romans 8. If you don't have one, we want to give you a gift. Raise up your hand and someone will give it to you. Are we excited today to get into this? I mean, I'm not going to try and go too long, but I'll just tell you, this is going to get pretty deep. I mean, this is something I had to get into and dig into because last week, Pastor Andrew shared, and what did he create? He created this anticipation. He set the stage of the ups and downs of Paul's life, the Apostle Paul, who said, imitate me as I imitate Christ, but who also said, the things I want to do, I'm not doing. And the things I don't want to do, those are the things I'm doing. I mean, what is he saying? And to me, it made me think, where are we going to go this week, even though I'm the guy that's preaching? You should be coming here today with the anticipation, what does God want to say? And I'll tell you something about anticipation. Any of you guys seen the new Star Wars movie? You can say yes, it's okay. Fire's going to come down. I'm a Star Wars fan, but not crazy. I enjoyed it growing up. I was more, you know, Bruce Lee and the martial arts. But I watched the new Star Wars movie, and when I came away, I too was thinking, what is going on? I'm thinking, who is Ray's father? I'm thinking, I mean, the best scene in the whole movie is when Chewbacca goes crazy because of you know what. I won't say it. Spoiler alert. Amen? I'm thinking, why is Kylo Ren going crazy, but now I have to wait 18 months to two years to figure out what is going on? Why am I saying that in church? Because after last week's message, even though I was the guy preaching, I'm like, Lord, I am anticipating what we are going to see. I am anticipating. It's so much more significant than Star Wars. I'm not saying don't go near that place. I'm just saying it's fun, but we anticipate so many things. But today, you need to know this is such an important position in not only the book of Romans, but in your life. If you get what I'm saying to you today, it will transform your life because you need to know who you are in Christ. You need to know how valuable you are, and you need to know how good of a gift God gave for you. Amen. Andrew set us up and said, next week, Brian is going to answer some of those questions, but we'll see. He actually answers them at the end of Romans 7. So what's going on? If you haven't been here and this is your first service, yes, we're going to get deep, but this is where we are so far. Paul the Apostle is writing to these Christians in Rome. They're his friends. He knows them. They've done ministry with him. And in the start of the book of Romans, he says, I long to come to you. He longed to visit them. He'd never been there. And I have to say amen and praise God that he never made it to them. Why? Because if Paul would have gone there, he would have shared all this in person, and we never would have had which book? The book of Romans. What Paul does is he's writing this book, and I would go as far as to say it is autobiographic. He's writing as a Jew. Paul was basically a terrorist that was killing Christians, and he's writing to believers like you and I to say, I hope you understand what God has done. It's the most doctrinal book as far as understanding all that's before us. And so here's what he does. He writes to them saying things like this. I am a Jew. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I am circumcised on the eighth day. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I get the laws. I get the prophets. I get the Levitical priest. He understands everything. And he's writing to them to let them know that all these religions, all these regulations, all the things they're holding on to, it isn't going to amount to much. How do we know that? Because in Romans 3, he dropped the hammer in 323, a famous verse, if you've done any kind of evangelism. And Paul says this to his own people. All have sinned and what? Fall and show the glory of God. You can't keep the Old Testament. You can't keep the Ten Commandments. You can't keep the law. When Paul, how then are we saved? How then are we born again? How then are we set free? And he says, 
birthing this verse in Romans 3.28, which actually launched the Protestant Reformation. Listen to this. He says, we are justified by faith apart from the works of the law. He's writing to these believers to say, it's not what you do. It isn't about your flesh. You are justified because you believe. In Genesis 15.6, it says of Abraham, he was justified because he trusted God. He said yes to the covenant. He was willing to take his son to sacrifice. And though God didn't require it, God was simply showing us that by his faith, there was something that would play out in his life. And so Paul begins to unpack this. He goes into Romans 6 about baptism. Everything sounds good. And then last week, it got really crazy. Amen? I mean, last week was like, wait a minute. Paul's saying the things I don't want to do, I do. And the things God calls me to do, I'm not doing them. And I mean, thank you, Pastor Andrew, for saying, man, I feel like that sometimes. Anyone else in here? It's okay to have those days when the flesh is speaking louder than the spirit. It's okay when you're head to head with your wife. It's okay when life is falling apart and the road rage is crazy. Does that mean you're in Christ or not? That's why I want to address this point today because I have seen friend after friend after friend who fell into crazy sin, doing the craziest things in their life. And a lot of it is because the foundation is shaky. What you're going to see today is how valuable to God for what he did in Christ. So I'm going to just read from this. Go for Romans 7 really quick, but stay there in Romans 8. He says in Romans 7, 19 from last week, Paul the Apostle, I do not do the good that I want to do. There it is. But the evil, and he actually says evil, that I do not want to do, that I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is what? Sin that is living in me. How can a Christian say that sin is living with me? And he's crying out saying, what is going on with my flesh? Why am I saying these things? Why am I having these thoughts? Why do I wish this guy would be quiet so I could get home to the Super Bowl game? Amen. Or now your mind's on Star Wars. You know, you still think this is milk. But the reality is he's saying, what is going on with me? And can I just tell you, we are flesh. We don't have it all together. Because what does he say in Romans 7, 24? He says, speaking of all of us, wretched man that I am wretched man that I am. And he asked the question, who will deliver me from the body that is subject to death? And in Romans 25, he gives us the answer. Thanks be to God who delivers me through who? Jesus Christ our Lord. So when Andrew said to you, where are we going to go? What is the answer? He was setting you up because the answer was already there. What do we get from this verse? Notice that Paul wasn't saying, what must I do? Notice he isn't saying, where must I go? Because you see, we live in a world that people are trying to figure out, what must I do? What standard should I live at? What way should I qualify? Which mountain should I go to? Where should I go? And even if you say, well, Brian, go to the temple. There hasn't been a temple since what? 70 AD. As a guy that wasn't a Christian for 24 years of life, the most of you in here in this room, you know my story. But my story is I came here to skateboard. I didn't know Jesus. I was a professional skateboarder. I got married, had a son, got divorced, was dead in sin, and had no clue about life. And my wife today is serving in the children's ministry. Amen. God restored that relationship, but how did he do it? I was asking the question of all these religions, what must I do? And so I get to the Old Testament, and God says, well, you better keep these commands. What must I do? Well, as soon as you're born, you've already broke them. Amen. Where must I go? Well, go to the temple. Like I said, the temple hasn't existed since 70 AD, so where can I possibly go? And for me, for seven months of anger management, community service, fighting with my ex-wife, buying a new home, being crazy, wanting nothing to do with a place like this, as I was reading through the Bible, God was revealing to me, a sinner, dead in sin, you can't keep the law. You are not good. There's no way you could go. I was going to God to fix my life, and God was coming to me, as you've heard me say, to reveal to me who it was all about. Paul didn't say, what must I do? Where must I go? He said, who? And what is his answer? Jesus. Why is it all about Jesus? Because from Romans 1 to Romans 7, he has set us up to make all these promises that fell short, to say it's not about what any of you do. Can I just release you guys from that? Can you stop trying to earn your salvation? Amen. You can't do it. You know what John MacArthur said? He said, if you could lose your salvation, you would. Would you or not? We didn't earn it. We can't lose it. It isn't about that. It's about the work of God. How do we know? Because Jesus showed up and changed my life 12 years ago. And it leads me to this verse in Romans 8 and 1. You ready? He says, because of everything I said in Romans 7, therefore there is what? Now. 
Not someday. There is therefore someday going to be no condemnation. This is now. This is today. This is you. This is while your mind is on the Super Bowl. This is while you're thinking crazy thoughts and all stuff is going on in your life. He's saying to me, if I can just be selfish, Brian, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because what? Through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. You just be honest right now. How many of you guys condemn yourselves? I condemn myself all the time. As a skateboarder, you want to make every trick perfect. Everything's meant to be the right way. As a Christian, that is not how my life is. Do I walk around trying to be a hypocrite? No, but there's flesh living inside of me. You're looking at it. I can condemn myself over and over. Maybe I can try and condemn you. Maybe you're sitting here condemning me. You have to come away today saying there is now what? No condemnation. You're going to get this point and see the beauty of the gospel. Verse 3, he begins to explain. He says, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh because of our nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. He says, and so he condemned sin in the flesh. Why? In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Verse 5, he says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is what? Life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It will not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. And you're saying, man, that is a lot of words. In teach team this week, they said, why don't we go from Romans 8, 1 to 2? There's people who spent two years just in these verses. It is so deep. If you want to lay out doctrine, you can do it all day. We're not going to do that today. We've been 13, 14 weeks in this book. But what are we seeing here? Let me ask you this question. In Romans 7, as Paul is talking about the things we shouldn't do, people that don't do what they say, what do we call those people? We do, don't we? We say they're hypocrites. So who is Paul talking about when he says, the things I say I'm going to do, I don't do? Am I saying be a hypocrite? No. What do we have? We have this term, you're either what? A sinner or a... Those in Romans 7, you know who they are? They're saints. They're not hypocrites. They're struggling in their faith. But he says they're not condemned. We live in a world where saints are those people and you have necklaces of them. You have statues of them. You pray to them. They build church windows with all these saints made of leads. But is that the picture of the saints we see in the Bible? Am I saying live in habitual sin? Am I saying continue what you're doing today? No, we're going to get far from it today. But Paul is beginning Romans 7 saying the things I don't want to do, this is what I'm struggling with. And you might see that and say, well, Christian, well, pastor, that's your example of how good you can live. That's not, that's not very attractive to me. But can I tell you for me, when I read Romans 7 and see these struggling hypocrites and see these people who fall short of the glory of God, I see people like you and I that get bored if you preach for too long, wish we had one verse to get into. So many other things were in our mind that when I see this passage of Scripture, you know what it shows me? How beautiful our God is. We're not good. We're the hypocrites. You've heard me say this. Christians can only truly be the real hypocrites because no one else has the truth. Only we do. But he starts this whole off. So take that picture of saints and what the whole church is presented as people that are godlier than now. They speak perfect. They're holier than now. That's not the Bible. The Bible is people who understand their dependence on God, their need for the flesh to die, and the power of the Holy Spirit to be at work in their lives. Can someone say amen? This is who the saints are. Those who have come to faith. And he says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Let me ask you this question. What is the Bible about? Anyone? Why did Jesus come to live? So there would be no condemnation. Why did he go to the cross? So there would be no condemnation. Why did he cover us in the blood? There would be no condemnation. Why is the 66 books of the Bible? So there would be no condemnation. The whole point of the Bible is God loved you. He saw you in sin. Me too. So I'm going to change something about this. So there would be what? No condemnation. This word used in Romans is only used in Romans throughout the whole Bible only three times. There's other times as words pertaining to condemnation, but Paul is using this word. There's no condemnation. Why is that important? Because he is always using it in the context of sitting before a judge. Put yourself in the courtroom right now, you and I. 
There's no condemnation. You guys are free to go. You guys ever got a driving ticket? You ever gone to court for anything? You're nervous as you know what? For what reason? And the judge says, you're good to go. You're free to go. Let's apply it to our Christianity. Who hung on the cross? What was his name? Who is the only person that's ever lived that doesn't deserve to go to the cross? Jesus. I'm meant to be hanging on that cross. You're meant to be hanging on that cross. One lie, I'm a liar, hang me on the cross. One lustful thought, adulterer. One feeling of hate, a murderer. All the things I did, you know what it did? It nailed me to that cross. And the Old Testament says anyone that is nailed to a tree, to a cross, they're condemned. You and I today as believers, are we the ones that got nailed to the cross? Yes or no? Listen to this. Don't turn there for lack of time. But listen to what Paul says in Galatians 3.13. He says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. Billions and billions and billions of people, everyone that has ever lived is meant to be hanging on a cross, and you don't have to. Why? There is no condemnation. Listen to how he presents it in Acts 13, 38. Listen to me. Learn to make the Bible very personal. What does he say? Acts 13, what does he say? What's the third word right there? Therefore, my what? He says, therefore, my friends, rock hard, but I want you to know that through Jesus, because of what he's done, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, Jesus, everyone in this room that believes is set free from what? Every sin. You're no longer condemned. What does he say? A justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. What is the opposite of condemnation? Justification. And they say so often, just as if I've never done it. Am I saying if your faith is in Jesus, you can never be guilty? Yes. You can never be condemned. If you're truly in Christ, if he's truly saved you, if you've truly been free, why is that? What did Jesus do on the cross? What did he shed? His blood. Do you ever think about the blood? Have you ever done a word search on the blood in the Old Testament and the New and see what it says? There's some weird stuff to do with the blood, right? I said this. I was vegan a long time ago, and I was a lot skinnier than this. Amen? Why are you guys laughing? I'm going to eat all I want. It's Super Bowl Sunday. The grace of God, I'm not condemned. But here's the reality here. Is there something strange about the blood we don't understand? What we don't understand is when Cain killed who? Abel. What did God say in Genesis 4.10? He said, do you know that your brother's blood, what does it say? That's a little bit crazy, right? Have you ever heard blood cry out? Is God a liar? Did Abel's blood cry out? What was it saying? Let me qualify it with the New Testament. Listen to what Hebrews 12, 23, 24 says. It says, Church, you have come to God who is the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus the mediator, thank you God, of the new covenant, and to the what? Sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What does that mean? It means when Abel died, his blood cried out. He's mad at me. He's guilty. Condemn him. Mark him. And God put a mark upon Cain. But when Jesus died, what does his blood cry out? As you and I are nailed to that cross, he says, who the sun sets free is what? Free indeed. They're no longer condemned. They're no longer guilty. They've been set free. Why? Because Jesus' blood is speaking a better word. There is now what? No condemnation. The opposite of condemnation is what? justification like i said just as if i'd never happened did a legal thing take place yes the bible says you were purchased first corinthians 6 20 you were bought at a price why is this important like i said so many of my friends run off into sin because they feel condemned they give up they say i'm not ready i heard d.a carson this week i don't know why this message came to me it was a three-minute video and he was talking about the first passover Let's go back a couple thousand years, the first Passover. Israel is in Egyptian slavery, Egyptian bondage. God sends Moses to Pharaoh. Here comes the plagues. And by the way, I'm going to wipe out everyone's firstborn son if you don't shed the Passover lamb, shed the blood over the doorpost. It sounds crazy, right? It's all pointing to Jesus. And if we have two Jews that day, we have a guy called Abraham. Let's just go with that, right? Or Jacob or Jacob. They're standing around and one says to the other, you know, I'm kind of nervous about tonight. Why are you nervous? Well, the death angel's coming down. Didn't you shed the blood? Didn't you put the, the blood of the lamb over the doorpost? Well, yeah, but you have three sons. I only have one. I mean, what if it 
you know, can I trust God? And the guy says, well, of course I trust God. Are you going to trust God? Well, he goes, yeah, I'm going to trust God. I applied the blood. So the death angel came down that night and the doorposts of Abraham and Jacob, what was covering them? Blood. Which children did he spare? Both of them. It's not about them. It's about the blood. Amen? Both of them were spared. You have to get this in your head. It's not about us. Paul is saying it's not the law. It's not religion. It is about the blood. How do you know you're in Christ? Do you hate sin? Do you flee from it? Do you understand the gospel as he opens your eyes? Is your trust in him? The blood, he says, there is now what? No condemnation. To go even further than that, and I'm harping on this for a reason. I want the people of Rock Harbor to know you're secured in Christ if this is your faith. Can Jesus ever be judged? Can Jesus ever be guilty? Can Jesus ever be condemned? When I get to the end of my life and I stand before God and he looks at me, am I guilty or am I set free? Do you know what the Bible says of you in Christ, Colossians 3.3? 3? He said, Brian, church. He said, you died and your life is now what? Hidden in Christ. He doesn't see me anymore. He forgets our sins is as far as from the east of the west. That's why Paul can say, I wrestle in my flesh, but my salvation has been secured. Romans 8.2, are you ready? This is why. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set us free from the law of what? sin and death i can only imagine what life group's going to be like this week amen i mean life group where are you even going to go with this much verse that we're talking about today in romans 8 there's so there's whole books written about just that verse but who is the unsung hero we find in romans 8 it's the holy spirit what is the whole story of the bible god created man in his image and he breathed the ruach the spirit of god into him man sinned ate of the tree separated from god Genesis 6 says God's spirit no longer dwelled with man. So God would only put his spirit up on certain people at times, prophets and priests and kings, to get his message across until when? When Jesus Christ came, what did John the Baptist, his cousin, say? I baptize with water. The one is coming after me who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Jesus told Nicodemus, you can't even see these things, John 3, unless you are born again. It's not a religion, it's a new nature. He said, go and wait in Galilee, go and wait in Jerusalem, you will be filled, Acts 1.8, with the power of the Holy Spirit. I need to go away. It's better for you if I leave so I can send who? The Holy Spirit. Why is that important? Ephesians 1.13, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. When you believed, when he opened your eyes, when you came to faith, you were marked. He put it on. It's a legal document. Innocent with the promised Holy Spirit. But I have to say that and qualify it with this. We use these words so casually. I went to church and I went to the front and I repented or I confessed. But in the original language, you don't see this. When someone says, I repent, it means a turning away, a fleeing from, a transfer. The word repent, this Greek word, you know what it is? Meta eo. So if I break it down and say meta, what other word can we get from that? A caterpillar becomes a butterfly because of what? A meta all has passed away, all has become new. If I'm really in Christ, when I came to faith, something happened, something in my nature. I went from being this wicked and sinful caterpillar, sorry caterpillars, to being this beautiful and profound butterfly in who? Christ. Is it because of my works? Is it because you show up to church on time? Is it because you quote the Bible better than anyone because you happen to have so great of a mind? No. It is because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ because of what? The blood, because of the cross, because of his love, and right here, because of the Spirit. In verse 3, he says, For the law was powerless to do this because it was weakened by the flesh. But God did this by sending his Son in what? The likeness of sinful flesh to a sin offering. Listen to me. I know this is a lot of text. But getting this foundation, it propels the rest of your faith. You are not condemned. You cannot be condemned if you are in Christ. God is not schizophrenic. Go and look at those verses you think says that. They will not say what people try and make them say. But what does he say here? He said, God sent his own son in the what? Likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus is fully God and fully man. But can I tell you, he's different than us. Jesus never has that word flesh. The word implied there is, yeah, there's skin. He has skin on him. He walked about like you and I. But you and I were born with something called the sin nature. Scholars and translators and theologians have wrestled with this and they can't find the right word. But when it says 
Jesus comes in the likeness of sinful flesh, it means he looked like you and I. But actually what was inside of him was very different. He never actually wrestled with sin the same way. How do we know this? Because in the garden, Adam and Eve fell. And they consummated. They were physical. And Adam's seed was in his wife. And from there, every male born came and the whole world was populated, right? Jesus isn't part of that lineage. Jesus was born of a virgin, the promised Alma, the young woman. And through him, there's no sin. So Jesus came looking like us, but he has a different nature. When you read Romans 7 and you say, what is Paul talking about? He is telling you there's the old nature that's Brian and there's the new nature and his name is the Holy Spirit. and He is in you if you're in Christ. Amen. How do I know this? Because I came here as a skateboarder at 15. I spent my whole week, Monday to Friday, skating six to seven hours a day, OCD. I want to learn every trick. Why? So on Saturday, I could go to all the schools and the schoolyards and where all the spots were and film for five or six hours. And if I wasn't tired, I want to skate the whole next day. Amen? Once in a while, someone would show up who'd say, I don't really want to skate tomorrow. Why not? I'm not going to be around tomorrow. I'm going to be busy. Why? I'm going to go to a place called church. I also had a couple of skateboarder friends, my Mormon friend, who says, yeah, I give 10% of all the money that comes into the church. I even had a friend that was 19 and 20 that had a girlfriend, and he particularly told me, I'm a Christian. The only thing my girlfriend and I do is hold hands. I know this is getting strange. You don't skate on a Sunday. You give your money to the church, and you only hold hands. Why do you even have a girlfriend? And we're talking about the sin nature. Amen? What I'm saying is the guy from, from England was not reading Romans 8, but what the verse is saying is, this is your old nature. It was about me and my career and money. I'm probably wanting to do whatever else I did at the time. It was all about me. But he says in this verse, what the law was powerless to do was weakened by the flesh. And in Romans 5, he says, those who live according to the flesh, listen to this, have their minds set on what the flesh desires. He says, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. My life was all about the flesh. But if I'm in Christ now, what should my mind be on? Think about it. Think about the people in this room. Who do you look at who's 60 and 70 that walk with the Lord? And you'll know because you know how they generally start their conversation? They don't mean to say it. They're not boasting. I was reading the Bible this morning. Or the Lord put this on my heart. Or I heard this in a sermon. Or I heard that. Why? Am I saying be religious? No. Give us this day our daily bread. People are generally praying. Why are we praying for the Costa Rica team? Because there is actually a bunch of kids going, amen. I'm going with them. Parents, they will be very safe. Amen. But why do we pray? Because the Bible says pray without ceasing. Why do we worship? Because the Bible says let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Why do we do all these christian -y things? And maybe you're saying, bro, it sounds so Christian. Let me ask you, what nature is saying that right now in you? Right now is about the time you're going, this is a long message. This is so much to think about. Hey, I get to be the guy delivering it. You think I want to listen to myself? I've heard this about 20 times already. I already feel condemned by the way I'm preaching. But what is he saying? Here's the hook. Jesus took it all for us. We're not condemned. We're in Christ. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. What happens here is he says, those who live in the flesh are functioning with the mind of the flesh. But he says, if you're walking with the Spirit, what? Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the flesh, but those in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Why would he focus so much on the mind? Is he talking to believers or non-believers? You might be saying, well, I don't really want to read. I don't really want to pray. I don't really want to sit in service. But can I tell you something about American culture? We're lazy. We work hard for our comforts. We don't work hard for someone else. And even when we work hard, you know what we do? We tell everyone we're working hard so they know it. But we live a life that is all about us. And here's where I have to draw a line. I hope that if some of these things are the things you're not doing, it's because of spiritual immaturity. I'm immature. As much as I'm Pastor Brian today and I'm preaching, try hanging out with me all week. I don't have it together. I'm like Paul saying, wretched man that I am. But who do I depend on? Jesus, who doesn't condemn me, who loves me and says, you knucklehead, what are you doing? Is this preaching to anyone right now? This is called the grace of God. This is called the saints who are in Romans 7, who are missing it, who Paul is qualifying himself with. But what does he say? Think about what he says in Romans 12, 1 or 2. Very famous verse, you already know. He says, don't be conformed to the pattern of 
this world, this time, what it tells you to think, look like, do with everything you're about. Don't be conformed to this pattern, but what? How do we get transformed then? By the renewing of our mind. He didn't say become born again. They're already in Christ, but they're immature, they're distracted. Leonard Ravenhill said, are the things you are living for worth Christ dying for? Jesus said, don't labor in vain. I can tell you the enemy, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the devil, Lucifer, is spending billions of dollars a year with money to make you so satisfied in things of this world that you haven't got time for the things of God. That's where the things that aren't of God come out of. Listen to this verse, profound and powerful. Let me ask you, is he speaking to the church or non-believers? 1 Corinthians 3, 1. What is the first thing he says? Who's he speaking to? The church. Are they in Christ? Yes. Are they condemned? No. What does he say? Hey, I'm just delivering the message. Look at this. Eye-opening. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still what? Worldly. They were caught up in the flesh. They were distracted. They are mere infants in Christ. And that is a good thing. If you're in here saying, where am I with the Lord? You could be hearing this saying, thankfully, I'm just an infant. I don't get it yet. He says, I gave you what? Milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you were still not ready. You know most of the television shows you put on a preacher now. You get five or six verses. People have a hard time sitting in a Sunday service and hearing a lot of verses. But can I tell you this? I travel the world and I'm seeing young men, 18, 19, 20, getting frustrated if you don't really preach the Bible to them. I go to churches where men say, thank you for making me sit still and listen to what God says because I know I need to hear it. We're so bent by the abortion clinics and bent by the presidents and bent by all this stuff. Why don't we just go back to the word because the Spirit anointed it and allow it to permeate our lives. Amen? People are getting a hold of this and seeing all the fluff that's out there. But he says, I couldn't address you this way. I had to give you milk. Here's a couple of verses of how good you look, how great your life is going out there. I'll see you next week. Hopefully, if you're partying a crazy and do weird, sinful stuff this week, I won't bring it up next week. I'm going to be accountable. This is preaching to me. He says, I couldn't address you. I had to give you the milk. He says in Colossians 3, 2, set your mind on the things above, not on earthly things. And let me say this. If you are crazy, distracted by sin, stop focusing on sin. Amen? If you're trying to stop smoking, stop talking about smoking. If you're trying to not eat McDonald's, just don't ever go there again. But don't focus on McDonald's. Amen? But here's the reality. It's not on what we're focused on. It's who we're not focused on. And I have to say this now to step on toes. This is the pastoral part of this. The last two weeks, if you are sitting here and you're fully living in habitual sin, where are you? I have to ask you the question, if you were my son or daughter, and you were saying, I'm going to marry this person, but here's how we hang out. I'm going to start this business, but here's how I deceive based on my taxes. Here's how I live my life. Whoa, pastor, don't go there. Here's the reality. I sent a book of mine this past week to a friend who's, and I'd say, a gentle, beautiful Christian man. I've known him for five or six years in his 40s. I mean, amazing guy. I've met him a couple of times. Lives out there in the middle of America. And he'd asked for a copy of my book, so I sent it to him on our marriage. And as he's reading it, he's like, man, this is just really blessing my wife and I. But I have to say... This is crazy. She confessed to me a few days ago that for the past 15 years, she's slept with over 20 men. So you've got to think about this. That is 15 anniversaries. That's 30 birthdays. That's 15 Valentine's Days. That's so much time saying, I love you, getting into bed with that person, writing cards, being around the kids, doing all these things. I would have to sit with that person and say, I don't see the other nature in this. I don't see the repentance. I don't see the goodness of the Lord. I get it. Your flesh can miss it. You can go crazy and road rage. You can, you know, don't go there. But people fall into sin. I see marriages restored from things like that. But I said to him, what do you want to do? He goes, I want to make it work. I'm going to talk to him and say, listen, this is 15 years. I'm basically expecting her to come to faith through this and actually get a regenerate heart and be different. Amen? At the same time, this week, another friend said to me of a guy that's in his 70s, listen, He's been to church more than all of us. Amen? He knows the Bible more. He's read it more. He's heard it more. And confessing to his wife, yeah, occasionally, you know, throughout our marriage, I went out and paid for services of women. You've got to think as a pastor, and God can redeem that. But you've got to say the problem there is either you're never in Christ 
that's hard to say we're immature. That's hard to say we're in the way. That's hard to say I'm hearing his voice but never listening. I get it. We're all stubborn, amen? I mean, how many of you guys have a wife, you know, you'll tell her something, she'll tell you something, someone else says it, and they just get it. We're stubborn, right? We want our own way. We think like that. But to say this many years, to see this many things, why am I saying this? Because my prayer over as nice of a message, as funny as this king could be, is that you're not condemned. Our heart is that you're not condemned. The center of the Bible is that you're not condemned. If we have this fluffy life of Christianese and thinking it's good, listen, American culture is very about gatherings and meetings and recovery centers, and this has become the new norm. None of it matters if your heart is not what? Regenerate. Think about this, Acts 1.8. Why do we even have the Holy Spirit? Why aren't we in heaven already? We have the Holy Spirit because He's called us to go out in the world and what? Preach the gospel, make disciples. We know the Bible says when you have the Holy Spirit, the goodness of the Lord, what? Leads us to repentance. Why am I saying this? Because I would hate to think that for couples that have been together for six years and are just living however they want, still saying they love Jesus, they might just never have had their hearts awakened and said, wow, why did I present such a picture of condemnation and love and grace? Because when you look at that, whatever else we're trying to do, it doesn't matter. Whatever else, and I don't think Paul was doing this. Paul tells me as a pastor to live above reproach. I should live at a standard. Should I look at my wife and say, well, I can go sleep around because I'm in Christ. What's the evidence of it? We're to flee from sin. We're not to listen to them. We're to put to death the things of the flesh. And he goes on, read verse 6 and 7 and 8 yourself this week. But in verse 9, he says, listen, you, however, now he's speaking to believers. He's defined the two natures. Jesus never had this sin nature, animalistic nature. That's who we are. But we can inherit justification in his presence you however are not in the realm of the flesh but if you are in the realm of the spirit what does he say next if if indeed the spirit of god lives in you and if anyone does not have the spirit of christ they do not belong to christ but if christ is in you and even though your body is subject to death you will all die because of sin the spirit gives what life he says in verse 11 if the spirit of him who raised christ from the dead is currently right now living in you he who raised christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit and he gives us the instruction in verse 12 it says therefore brian therefore church therefore you today we have an obligation it is not to the flesh to live according to it put it away don't walk in it flee for if you live according to the flesh you will die but if by the spirit what you put to death the misdeeds of your body you will live Am I going to micromanage everything you think? No, we're all aware. God is moving and ministering in us. But there's very specific things that if I found my kids doing, I'd probably kick their backside. Amen? Spiritually, of course. I'd lay hands on them in the, in the spirit. But what I'm saying is, what we've done with American Christianity is he took away the conviction, took away the accountability. And when I see how wretched I am, I see how good God is. When I was sitting in Romans 7 saying, that's me. I could write a list of the places I miss it, but I'm going to grow. I'm going to get better. Amen. What Paul is doing here, look what he says. He says, if by the Spirit, and a verse that whether I'm preaching it or not, it always makes it into my sermons, Romans 8, 14. He says, those who are led by the Spirit of God are what? Children of God. Does the Lord lead you to repentance? You might not know the things you're meant to do. You might not be in the Word. I talked about spiritual immaturity, but is He leading us? And we have to qualify it with this. How can I possibly be a Christian and still be struggling with sin? Which by struggling, I mean getting better, moving forward. This is how. Who is the author and finisher of my faith? Is it me? No. Jesus said, I am the author and finisher of your faith. He who began a good work is faithful to finish it. It told in the Bible to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There's three stages we see. When you come to faith, you have salvation. The rest of your life, God is working in you. Should you die, you go be with the Lord. He's continuing to make me better, help me, for as much as I depend upon Him, for as much as I turn to Him, bearing fruit. And finally, when you die, you stand before God. And what do we have? Glorification. Salvation, sanctification, and glorification. And where do we see this? Where do we see this lived out in the Bible? This is crazy. John 8, a woman caught in the act of adultery. They walk into the room. Something happened. This woman was doing something she shouldn't have been. She was a prostitute. And what takes place? The religious leaders took her, going to condemn her, probably with rocks in the hand, ready to kill this woman. 
She realized who she was. She realized she was about to die. And God was obviously doing something in her heart because they brought her before Jesus. Jesus says, let those who have no sin throw the first stone. And he began to write on the floor. Your life, your salvation is between you and the Lord. But he began to write on the floor, probably sins, lying, lusting, blaspheming, self-righteousness. Who knows what? But those men that day knew that what he was writing, they were guilty of. They needed help as well. And so he turns to her and he says, where are your accusers? Do they condemn you? He said, they're gone. He said, neither do I condemn you. But is that the end of the story? No. He said next, therefore, go and what? Sin no more. Do I think she returned to being a prostitute if she see what Christ did? No. Do I think she got some road rage driving on the 405? Possibly. Do I think she says things out the side of her mouth sometimes when she shouldn't? Yes. But there comes a point where you need to take the sin in your life and say, okay, where am I in this? And just bow our heads for a moment, you guys. This is a dry, intense message. This is the message that says over everything what the pastor was saying today is, do you know God? Have you put your faith in Him? Do you see that He went to the cross for you? You can be set free. Maybe you're spiritually immature and it's time to put things away. Maybe you're dead in sin. You say, wow, I need to just cry out to God. Maybe you're just like, thank you, God, that I'm in you, and you just want to praise and worship. I want to get out of the way today, but I want to invite you. Sit for some time with the Lord. Listen to some lyrics. Think about what he did in your life. Consider that in the midst of Super Bowl Sunday, you are not condemned if you are in Christ. If you need prayer, if you want to take communion, if you want to talk about anything, we'll be at the crosses at either side of the room. But just now today, can we just praise and worship God and send him our offerings as we stop and pause and say, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Let's begin to worship, church. Amen.